Hello, uh, Cyber Resilience, Keeping Our Cities Safe. Here with us for this conversation, we have Mike Hamilton, who advises Washington State on issues of cybersecurity. Uh, before that, he led cybersecurity efforts for the city of Seattle. He's here with David Raymond, Deputy Director of the IT Security Lab at Virginia Tech. And back to lead the conversation is Mary Louise Kelly. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to you both. I'm going to take a moment to read you the lead to a story that the Washington Post ran this summer. This was in August. Dateline here in Washington, D.C. Jeff Bezos? <clears throat> nope. Paper? Nope. Well, Jeff Bezos' paper, yes. Different byline. All right, here we go. First, the power goes out. It's not clear what's gone wrong, but cars are starting to jam the streets. The traffic lights are down. And something seems to be going haywire with the subways, too. No one can get to work. And even if they could, what could they do? A cyber attack has driven the city to a halt. Now, this has, of course, not happened yet uh, in Washington. But the article goes on to describe just how easily it might. It gives the example that researchers uh, just last year found the traffic monitoring system here in DC was flawed in ways that could allow a hacker to falsify traffic data, stop all the traffic lights, and it's not clear that it's been fixed. All they will say is they're continuing to review the security system. So David, I'm gonna throw this to you first because you're quoted in this article saying the potential attack surfaces of a city are a huge challenge. Explain, what do you mean? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so, uh, as we get more and more connected, uh, a few weeks ago we had Cyber or Smart Cities Week here in Washington, D.C., for okay. example. Cities are more and more connected. Traffic, you know, traffic monitoring is one example. You have various critical infrastructure sectors, uh, um, industrial control systems, much of which are now connected to the Internet because that saves companies money from ha having to send people out in the middle of the night to, to check on the status of a system, for example. So lots of connected systems. Lots of them are siloed, right? So you have... 16 critical infrastructure sectors plus non-critical infrastructure sectors, and each one of those different sectors is uh, um, responsible for its own security. Some of, some of them do an okay job, some of them obviously do not, uh, and there are interdependencies between all these critical infrastructure sectors. So, so in a city um, where there's often no overarching cybersecurity uh, um, uh, plan or, or um, service center or response, um, you know, you have all these interconnected systems and uh, nobody who is looking at the city as a whole and securing the whole thing. And let me drill down on what you just said. You said in a city where there is often no overarching plan. Really? I mean, mm -hmm. in 2015, there are, there are big cities out there that have no plan. Yeah, so some cities do it well and some cities don't, frankly, yes. I mean, it's like a company. Some companies secure their infrastructure very well and some of them don't. And, uh, you know, in, in a city, security is a cost center, right? It doesn't improve the, the lives of of the residents in any way. It simply costs the government money to, to have to uh, provide this service, and uh, oftentimes it's just not done well. Mike Hamilton, you've been ringing the alarm bell on this for years from the other side of the country. How does, how does the threat look from Seattle? Um, I, I would uh, agree 100%. You know, some cities do it well, but they are really the exception. And I think it's becoming less of the exception, but for the most part, uh, cities um, rely on vendors to supply a lot of technology and the, 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 the main mode that cities, um, they're reactive. Government manages by landmine. So we wait for something to go wrong and then we're gonna overcorrect. And that's generally the way it happens. Um, but to David's point, um, local government cuts across a lot of the critical sectors that are defined by Homeland Security. So Seattle has uh, dams, water purification, waste treatment, traffic management, communications for law enforcement, emergency management, all that stuff, all those are all critical sectors. Um, the, the vendors that we rely on to, and I don't work for the city of Seattle anymore, but the vendors that tip, typical cities rely on, come in and they, they put things in place, and it's okay, it's good, it works, and then there's no plan on how to uh, um, uh, uh, keep things secure as time goes on, because everything deteriorates. So things like facility lighting systems and HVAC are some of the things that are the tip of the iceberg when you're starting to talk about smart cities and how you implement these efficiencies. As more and more and more of that technology comes in, and some of it's kind of creepy too. 
monitoring your MAC address of your phone as you drive down the street so that we understand what traffic flow looks like, right, or some of the things that are being automated license plate readers and some of these other things. Um, those are getting deployed out there and we are finding that um, they are highly attackable and so the landmine is probably not that far away. You mentioned, I mean, this is an interesting point that, that some of the vulnerability comes from outside the actual city employees. You're, you're talking about vendors, you're talking about other points in and you mentioned HVAC. There was a frightening episode uh, when you were working for the city of Seattle, and this stems just to give everybody the, the background, the big um, target hack that, that everybody's familiar with. They, they managed to trace that back, and the, the vulnerability was the heating and aircon contractor. Uh, you know, they managed to trace it back to that, so you're looking at that. Seattle decides to upgrade, and what happened? So, uh, th so this is not, Se so Seattle has had problems with HVAC and um, <clears throat> But there was one in particular for a different city in the Northwest, and okay. they had done um, a refresh of the management console used for HVAC, and they had a brand new CD from the vendor, put it on the, on the, uh, the management console, and it immediately started to send out spam as if it was yahoo.tw, the Taiwanese Yahoo. And so directly from the vendor, already compromised, sending out, and what happened uh, later that day, or I think it was a couple of days later, uh, Taiwanese Yahoo was blacklisted. So ask yourself, who did that? And Were you able to, I mean, what? what no, we, you know, we took a wild guess, which is probably accurate. I mean, <laughs> who else would it be? Uh, you know, but, but the implication there is that the vendor had been compromised and they right. were sending out compromised CDs, which means the supply chain there has been perverted. And those are the kind of things that are becoming a bigger and bigger concern in and cities. The, the consequences, the implications of that are what? It's obviously, you know, it's annoying to get spam, but what would they have been able to so, do, see, steal? So technically, the HVAC for the data center was uh, under the control of somebody on the other side of the world. And if you shut down HVAC in a data center, you have about seven minutes to get your act together and then you're gonna lose everything. So just to make sure I understand, you're saying somebody in Taiwan and China could potentially sure. have shut this down. Absolutely. They were controlling the HVAC or could have control it in the city. Yes. I'm almost sorry they couldn't do it because you could have traced back male or female, you know, if they chilled the rooms down to 57 degrees frigid, we could assume this was a male hacker at work over on the other Quite side likely. of the world. Quite likely. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen it happen for a different reason. Okay. Because that would have been one of the landmines that we're waiting for that will get us to say, okay, it's, start to, it's time to start really thinking about using uh, market forces to make security happen, and we're just not going to buy it anymore, vendors, unless you can prove it's secure. And when we have a vendor hold up his or her hand and say, buy my stuff because it's more secure than that stuff, then we will have turned the corner. Right now, we bolt on instead of requiring that it's baked in. So, you know, we're just waiting. Yeah, let, me, let me turn to you. I mean, just to, to take this target hack that I mentioned. I mean, they, when they traced that back, it was the, the vendor who was connecting into Target's um, networks for, um, for billing and contracts sure. and was able through that to see all kinds of customer information and, and data. Theoretically, any vendor who's paying their bills that way, has that kind of in? I mean, the yeah, vulnerability well, is huge. So that does, I mean, that, that sounds like uh, the, uh, the vendor's fault, but really that's Target not doing due diligence to make sure that the vendor, uh, make sure, first of all, that, that the vendor is reliable, second of all, making sure that they only give access to the vendor what the vendor requires in order to do their business. So, so um, you know, it, it is, you know, you could sort of point to this external vendor and say that they were, they were the issue, but, but really Target has a piece of that too. But you know, in a city where you have a, a variety of different vendors, um, and, and nobody who is who, who is doing quality control on the vendors uh, to make sure that that the systems that they bolt onto your city are secure, then you could have uh, absolutely very similar problems. So what's really required is uh, you know, market forces. Okay, let's have an underwriters laboratory for for cybersecurity uh, uh, companies, which there is a there's um, an effort. Uh, spearheaded by Peter Zatko, who, um, Mudge, some you may have heard the name, uh, well-known uh, security researcher who is who is um, getting ready to start a, an effort 
along those lines. But also what cities can do, and what we do as a university, so I'm involved in the security uh, of the Virginia Tech network, and, and it's, it sort of parallels a city, right? This very large scale network, uh, 45,000 uh, uh, folks, 100,000 endpoints. Uh, we have our own police force, we have our own traffic management, we have our own power plant. So we have, uh, you know, we, we face a similar problem to a city. And uh, what we require for uh, um, any sort of information technology purchase is that the, the uh, purchase is vetted by the security office. Uh, um, and and the, the city could take a similar tack. The, the city can't purchase uh, these sorts of technologies until they're first vetted by somebody who can say that, yes, this meets requirements for, uh, for data encryption, for uh, um, <clears throat> you know, firewalls, uh, et cetera. We, we, we've talked a little bit about what you're worried about, what an attack might look like, and what parts of the infrastructure it, it might um, it might hit. Tell me about who you're worried about, because it's 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 not hard to imagine who would be interested in hacking a big financial institution like you know, J.P. Morgan Chase at getting all of the financial information. Who is it that wants to hack a city? Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, the who right now is, is uh, um, you know, th there are folks who may have the capability to do the kinds of things that we're talking about. And, you know, so what I would foresee is sort of a worst case scenario, right? You have all these interconnected components of critical infrastructure. And you could imagine that there are certain sort of pressure points where somebody could, could uh, uh, take some action in a couple of different uh, areas. So, so d just a, a short little uh, aside. Uh, 2001, there was a, a, a um, commuter train derailment in Baltimore. Okay. S sort of a common occurrence happens. Uh, that, of course, caused uh, delays with road traffic and with, with the train traffic. But what it also did was it broke a um, water main, flooded much of downtown Baltimore. Power stations were flooded. Now the city lost, much of the city lost power. What also happened was a, uh, a, a, a fire was created that severed a fiber optic cable that connected several companies between New York City and Washington, D.C. So now you have this, you know, com large components of the eastern seaboard that are taken off the network. You have a city that loses power. You have flooding. You have uh, these cascading effects from a, a train derailment, which is a fairly, you know, s small scale event. Um, you can imagine. Now, who would want to do that? Well, you know, right, right now you can imagine there are maybe some state-sponsored actors who could perhaps um, be able to put something like that together. They could understand the interconnectedness and, and cause those things to happen, but uh, uh, certainly no motive to do that that we know of right now. You have other actors that could potentially have the motive, terrorists, for example, but they don't have the, the technology to pull it off. Um, the concern comes when you have somebody that has both the motive and the technology. That, um, that Washington Post article that I cited at the beginning of our conversation describes an incident from 2008. This was in Poland, but speaking of derailments, uh, it describes Polish police investigating a tram derailment. 12 people were injured. They traced it back to a 14-year-old kid uh, who had allegedly taken control of steering the tram via, a, he jerry-rigged his remote control for his TV. I mean, it's hard to know whether to be reassured that this is not some evil criminal mastermind or terrified that it's apparently so darn easy. Well, that's, you know, that's why I, I wrap my mind around a taxonomy of different threat actors, right? And the, and the very lowest one is the background noise of the internet. It's just always ongoing. There's stuff, you know, I, I, I don't know how technical the audience is, but if you throw up uh, an SSH server and expose port 22 to the internet, the yeah. password guessing will start in five minutes, for real. Uh, and most of the password guessing comes from 10 cities in China with universities. And it's just, so that's the background. And then there's unsophisticated criminals of opportunity, the experimenters, there's uh, uh, hacktivists, right, anonymous. And they showed up at the city of Seattle every time the Seattle cops were above the fold, which for a while was all the time. Um, and then organized crime is always trying to steal something. And then it's nation states, terrorists, and then the hybrids. Because if countries like, uh, not even countries, if a terrorist organization doesn't have the capabilities to do something, they can just go hire organized crime. And right now, Russia's got a little bit of an unemployment problem. And so um, that's a happening right now. So it's this wide range, and the question becomes, um, and, and I like your, um, your procurement 
um, strategy where you have to get security to vet a, a procurement. I would add to that the contractual part of that so that the definition of who is going to manage security in an ongoing way is defined as well. But <clears throat> that's part of raising that risk bar. What's your tolerance level? You know, are, are you gonna let hacktivists do, do their thing to you? Probably not. You'll never get that risk bar all the way up to where a nation state or a terrorist organization or a hybrid is, won't be a problem. That's always going to be there. That's what I would consider the residual risk that you need to insure, transfer that risk through insurance. So I don't know if there's any insurance people in the audience, but you're doing it all wrong. It's not a big blob. It's certain assets that you need to insure and only the residual risk. Talk to me later. You know, we talked some in, in the first session this morning about how it was unclear to the people up here on stage with me who in the federal government owns this problem. You know, it should fall within the Department of Homeland Security, but it's not entirely clear who, who's writing the rules on this. Is it clear at the local level? Is it clear at the city level? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think it is. I mean, you know, the, the Department of Homeland Security uh, is responsible for securing the .gov, which uh, uh, they may or may not do a good, a good job of. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the DOD who's responsible for the dot .mil. I mean, you don't have anybody who's responsible for, from a from a national perspective for the, for dot .com or or dot .edu or et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's that's certainly a problem. And what about for Baltimore or for <coughs> Seattle or New Orleans? Is there somebody empowered, or is this part of the part of the challenge to to have regulations, have standards that that apply across all of the different city regulatory issues? The, p the person in charge um, can make more money in the private sector and they know that the value proposition for going to work in the government is that you get Groundhog Day off, right? And lots of holidays and stuff like that, as opposed to these enormous salaries that are being paid out in the private sector. And so Ari Schwartz just left the White House. Why? Because now you go in the private sector and triple your salary. And it w it's, it, we have to do something, we have to commoditize practitioners to be able to give cities, local government that cut across all these critical sectors, um, um, uh, access to these practitioners. And then there will be chief security officers in cities who do have a top-down approach and can work with all of their different agencies. Right now, it's so fractured that um, the exposure is huge. Yeah, so right now, it's like companies, right? Each company takes their own uh, um, risk and decides whether they're going to have a security officer or not. Uh, um, cities are the same way. There's, there's nobody mandating that a, that a city has uh, any sort of cybersecurity infrastructure. That, that's that may be uh, um, coming. Th that, that may be coming. That may be a good thing to do. But really, it's incumbent right now upon the city to say, "Hey, we need this is a problem. We need to, we need to take action." And, and you know, uh, so uh, as Mike mentioned, some cities d do a, a, a good job. Some, uh, you know, that may be the, the minority. Uh, you know, so we talked to a couple of cities. Uh, in our research, um, and we sort of very anecdotally um, saw that there seemed to be sort of a sweet spot, right? You have a huge city that that is, you know, it's hundreds of years old, and um, it's so fractured that it's just almost impossible to get your arms around. You have a small town in America where they just don't have the money to, to uh, try to tackle this problem. But there's sort of a middle, you know, a couple hundred thousand people city maybe that, that you know, it's a, it's a tractable problem, and... Uh, um, they have the money to actually get after it. Uh, and that, those, I think, are the cities that, that may be doing a fairly decent job of it. Y'all keep saying some cities do this well, some cities don't. Can we name names here? I mean, I is there a name. city that's doing this really well, hitting I, it out of the park that everybody looks to? I, I, I know of a city that is taking the approach and doing a ground up um, uh, engineering of uh, smart city technologies. A in, Bay City, you said. A City, Spokane, a city. Washington, okay, Spokane. is actually okay. doing a really good job of starting from the ground up and saying, here's how we're going to buy stuff, here's how it's going to be managed, here's what the vendors do, here's what we do, here's how we need to staff up, and frankly, here's how our staff needs to be reallocated as we move into, you know, this smart city thing, right? There are rooms full of people that manage telephones, desk telephones. We don't need that anymore. I mean, so people have got to be repurposed too, and I think Spokane, in particular, um, is doing a pretty good job of doing this from the ground up. That's probably the only example I can think of. The only one. Yeah. Huh. What about globally, outside the U.S.? Is anybody ahead of the curve on this? I don't think I know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know of any. Don't know of any. Okay. What about what cities are most at risk? 
the obvious ones, if you know, we all watch Homeland or it's whatever, David, is it? It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, David made a point about cascading failures. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you have the kind of exposures where there are inter interdependencies like that, where one part can be attacked and make five fail, you know, those are the scary ones. I don't want to, you know, you don't want to name names. And that would be bad. But if you are the, the activist or the know, fledgling terrorist sitting in the basement somewhere in the Middle East or in Russia or in North Korea, uh, you know, there, are, there are obvious cities that you're looking at. Are the resources being deployed appropriately to protect them? No. No. Government manages by landmine. We're going to wait for something bad to happen, and then we're going to fix it. You step on it, you and know, then you with, deal you, with the aftermath. Because, uh, you know, government, especially local government, is not regulated at all. I mean, there are pockets of records you know, the dreaded records breach that everybody thinks is the worst thing that can happen. Governments have health records and human services department. They have criminal justice records that are regulated. Um, they take payment card data. They have personally identifiable information, so they have to worry about the data breach reporting statutes that are in the states. And so, you know, because of those little bit of regulatory oversight, you know, they do things to secure those records. But the infrastructure, you know, the control systems that are used to inject chlorine into water and open water valves and manage waste treatments and, uh, you know, especially uh, governments that have their own uh, energy uh, companies. Seattle City Light is one of the largest munis in the country and, you know, we had nation states coming by trying to take over the computers of what are called the power marketers, the people that trade energy over the grid. Uh, yeah, so. Wait, wait, wait. Explain that. You said you had nation states looking at this. Yes. Uh, so this was, um, we got, um, uh, we had a bunch of email come in that were uh, fake intelligence briefs. Okay. And uh, they had very bad things associated with the PDF that they wanted people to open. And so we got in front of it and nobody got, got these delivered. But then we looked at who were these delivered to, and there was a great preponderance of um, people that are called power marketers. And so there's the one, they're the ones that negotiate trades of energy over the grid. Um, we investigated this a little more, and one of the emails came in not to an email address, but to an instant message address that we had alias to an email address. Uh, that is significant because, um, and I'm not making this up, uh, power marketers, at least the ones on the West Coast, when they negotiate trades of energy, that they're going to move over the grid. Bonneville, you have to open up transmission lines. They do that with AOL Instant Messenger. Wow. Not making this up. So as we investigated this ourselves, we came to the conclusion that, um, and, and the FBI would neither confirm nor disconfirm this, uh, but do you remember China hacked Google? Google has, uh, they make their own power for data centers and they have power marketers. And we think that they lifted all of the contact information for power marketers across the US and then did a concerted attempt to try and um, take over the computers that are used by those folks. I'm struck, you know, it's, it's a problem with, with the vast resources of the federal government, accountability and, and trying to sort out, you know, who is responsible for say, Sony attacks, which the government now tells us they firmly believe was North Korea. For a local city, I mean, the size of Seattle is one thing that you were talking about, cities, 200,000 people. Do cities remotely have the resources to, to try to track this back? And if you're trying to protect yourself, figure out who you're protecting yourself against? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that most don't right now. It, you know, w it wouldn't be that difficult to spin up that capability. But uh, um, you know, you have to find the talent to do it, which is which is lacking right now. Uh, you know, you have to have you have to have education programs that produce the right people that that can do this across cities across the nation. Wow. Right? It's just the, the talent is not there. I mean, there are probably folks in this room who are trying to hire security people yeah. for their companies, willing to pay a lot more than a city will to those folks. You know, if, if they're talented and, and know what they're doing. So it, it's you know, lot, lots of talent shortfalls. All right. Well, speaking of folks in this room, we have time for a question or two, so let me open up the floor. I saw your hand first. We'll get the mic over to you. This is really interesting. I miss you, Worthon, with the Naval Postgraduate School and was lucky enough to be a part of the Defense Department's introduction to IT. What presented a problem for DOD in getting help were the acquisition rules, that when the government buys, it has to have fair acquisition process. And I would argue that our, our acquisition process, our systems, not of, across the 
country don't help us fix this. But somebody has to take the lead in telling us what to do so we're not so vulnerable. What are your answers and how do we make it happen? And more importantly, how do you educate the American public to understand what needs to be done in order to make us safe? A lot of questions there, but maybe, maybe if you start with the, um, the American public. I mean, cities are made up of citizens, people who live there. How does that factor into the equation of the work that you're both doing? It's the kind of thing where I think citizens need to start asking questions about this. They need to understand the critical services that cities provide, clean water, you know, you steal my credit card, boy, man, that is really annoying, but if my toilet won't flush for three days, that is the end of the world, <laughs> okay? And you know, people understand this. And um, I think that these questions need to start being asked, you know, as part of the political process. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's starting to happen yet at the local level, I believe it is at the federal level, but it will percolate down, and again, you know, we have enough of a disaster, it's gonna be on everybody's mind. You know, first time you call 911, because your kid's choking and it doesn't work, the whole credit card discussion goes out the window. Yeah, you know, I think right now we're in a situation where people are more interested in saving money through, uh, um, you know, with the, with the ultra-connected power utilities than they are with uh, um, providing more security to, to the to that infrastructure. So, you know, until, as Mike mentioned, until, you know, there's some event, some landmine, um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure we're gonna make a lot of progress. But that's not a good scenario, that we wait until we step onto the landmine and then we, yeah, we and then we, we get roll. everybody to buy <laughs> We have a history. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the education piece, I, I agree, it's extremely important, not only ex uh, educating the population, but, but putting together education programs so that we can train people to, to secure these things. I know, that, I know NPS does, does a lot of that. Uh, um. I, I have a quick answer. Apple has a wonderful buzzword sentence. If you don't know, ask. We all learn together. That's a culture change. And if you build that in and say, curiosity is more important than exposing your ignorance, all of our systems should make that the way in which we operate. Because the body of knowledge is so enormous, nobody can understand it all. in the back of the room, yes sir. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Bill Cunningham, Creative Investment Research. So we posted our first website November 16th, 1995. One of the things I'm worried about, and talk about this transfer of domain responsibility away from NTIA. Why are we doing that? Uh, you talked about controlling, I mean, right now we invented the internet and we controlled the domain name structure. At some level, I'm not saying we control the whole thing, but it's in the US. Now we're moving away, we're gonna kind of open up the domain name control mechanism to the rest of the world. Sounds like a good idea, but from a cybersecurity perspective, it's a nightmare. Talk about that policy. Boy, I'm not an expert, but, but uh, you know, the, 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 the internet in general uh, um, is, uh, you know, it, it's, um, used for a lot of things and democratization of the internet is seen as a, as a good thing, f uh, particularly in countries where regimes don't let people uh, uh, communicate freely and et cetera. So, uh, you know, I, not personally not an expert on the domain name system. I mean, I certainly understand how it works, but, but the, the, the motivations behind expanding, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's not, I, I, think it's, I think it's just this effort for, for um, you know, to allow countries to have a say uh, other than the United States. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know much about the politics around ICANN and IANA and NTIA and all that stuff, but I can tell you that the explosion of top-level domains was poorly thought through um, because now it, they were immediately monetized by organized crime, and, and it, it just made, it exacerbated an existing problem. Uh, yes, right here. Hi, Dana Priest from the Washington Post. I'm interested in your interaction with law enforcement, both in um, both at the FBI level and at either the state or local level. How do you rate their uh, forensic capabilities and then um, their capabilities to carry out investigations that result in um, you know prosecutions or charges? 
Yeah. Just on the local level, what are you seeing there? I'll, I'll take this one first because we have a, 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 a very good integration in the Pacific Northwest with law enforcement. Um, we, so first of all, the, the role of local law enforcement I think is evolving and needs to. There are a lot of things that can happen and you have no way to report these. So 60% uh, of domestic violence victims have some kind of spyware on their phone and their abusive spouse is tracking them. Who do you go tell about that, right? Local law enforcement, they don't know what to do, really. Um, and what's happening is they are, um, how do I say this without getting beat up when I get back? Um, okay, so your Washington Post isn't gonna tell anybody? <laughs> So um, there, uh, local law enforcement gets a lot of grants and they go to conferences and there are surveillance technologies that are there for them to buy and use. And you've heard of automated license plate readers, stingrays, fake cell towers, things like this. And because the adoption of these technologies is so far out in front of the policies that we need to manage this stuff, they hit their own landmines. You're doing what? What's a stingray? You're doing what? That conversation is starting to come up a lot. And I think that, um, first of all, local law enforcement needs to have a defined role here. And that means that there needs to be statutory oversight at the local level, defining what is a crime, or maybe the state level, defining what is a crime, where is the purview of local law enforcement. Their forensics capabilities are actually pretty good. Um, and I would say in our state, the state law enforcement has got some pretty good capabilities there too. Where this all converges, where I hope it all converge, where we're trying to make it all converge is the Fusion Center. So a Fusion Center is where state, federal, local law enforcement, DEA, DHS, I mean, you know, the whole alphabet soup of everybody is there. Um, and what we are trying to do is monitor across our region. So cybersecurity events that occur at six cities and counties and six maritime ports and a couple of energy utilities all go to one place and we make that available to an analyst at the Fusion Center who is not a law enforcement analyst but has the touch points over there. Um, have we figured this out? No, I mean, we're trying to do now a multi-state initiative to try and get a few other states to help us figure out what's the, what's the way here. Uh, but trying to use the Fusion Center as a focal point for law enforcement and trying to help them understand where is, what, what their purview is um, is something we're actively engaged in. Has that worked out? Not a chance. So can you address specifically the FBI and, and how you've seen their role uh, inside cities, whether you think their capabilities are at all close to where they should be? So a very quick response maybe from you, David Joe, yeah, so, FBI. Uh, so pr previously I was on faculty at West Point. We had occasion to work with the FBI in New York City, uh, uh, their cyber crimes unit, and, and uh, my s assessment was they were, uh, they were very competent, and if they got the, the, the data that they needed, then uh, they knew what to do with it, and they could, they could trace it back. The, the challenge, is, as Mike uh, mentions, is, is getting, uh, having a, a forum, a fusion center, something to get the data to the right place that, so that it can be analyzed. All right, let me thank you both. Mike Hamilton, David Raymond, thank you. And sit tight for one second. Um, because I'm going to introduce our next panel. We are in Washington, as you know. We are in the full swing of an election season, as you know. I think that means we're bound by law to talk politics at some point this morning. <laughs> Luckily, you two are relieved of that. I'm going to turn that over. My colleague Steve Clements has volunteered for duty, and he's going to be up next. We're going to swap places so we can talk about the politics of cybersecurity. Right. Thank you.